Each episode of UX Podcast requires about 10 hours of work by myself, James, and our producer, Remy, together with other related costs like hosting equipment and so on. This puts the production cost of each show in excess of 1,000 euros. So help support UX Podcast and the UX community by contributing financially to keep the show running. Visit uxpodcast.com slash support and contribute as much as you can. UX Podcast episode 219. You're listening to UX Podcast, coming to you from Stockholm, Sweden. Helping the UX community explore ideas and share knowledge since 2011. We are your hosts, Pat Axbom. And James Roy Lawson. With listeners in 188 countries from Lebanon to Norway. Stephen P. Anderson is a speaker, educator, and design leader based out of Dallas, Texas. A former high school teacher who now has more than two decades in the design industry and is currently Head of Design at Capital One's Innovation Garage. His personal mission? To make learning the hard stuff fun by creating things to think with and spaces for generative play. Stephen is also an author, wrapping up his second book, Figured Out, Getting from Information to Understanding. And back in 2011, he published Seductive Interaction Design. At UX Alex this year, we had the chance to talk to Stephen in person around the intriguing topic of facilitating structures. We touch on the dogma of tools, the paternalism of design, <laughs> and the need for humanity-centered design, and the designer as a coach. You're going to talk soon about the, the visual display um, of information, which in, its, in itself sounds like a very exciting topic. Um, and, and, but you're also talking about the future of design. Um, I, l- I love the spread of these. But what is it? What is it that's giving you the kind of the urge to to speak at the moment? Oh gosh! Uh, well, as always, I'm interested in way too many topics. Yeah. So I think that's why you see a workshop on one thing, completely unrelated to the the keynote um, that I'm giving. Uh, I think behind it all, though, I, I'm I'm only just learning how to articulate what's behind it all, right. and it's really this passion for learning, education, teaching, facilitating, that I think has been there all along. Um, my going way, way back, my background was actually, uh, uh, I was an, an educator. I taught mm. high school English and gifted and talented classes. Oh, yeah, high school level. So, okay. um, so I think that's part of why I returned to doing workshops in, I don't know, the mid-2000s or so. Mm. Uh, but I think that idea of how do I facilitate someone's discovery is coming through more and more. So doing a workshop... Uh, Obviously, that's like facilitating people's journey to discovery and learning. And my own workshops have gone from, I guess, master classes is what you would call them, where it's more me lecturing and mm. occasional exercises to now. Um, my goal is to speak as little as possible and, and facilitate as much as, as, much as possible. Uh, so, yeah, there's definitely that. Uh, I think I'm using the phrase facilitating structure, facilitating structure. Uh, behind everything. Yep. Well, it's interesting to say that you think it's it's moved. Uh, you've you've moved on maybe of how you used to work with things. I, I remember when we first met you, two thousand eleven. Um, the the concepts you were communicating, um, you know, through the cards you had, and also mm-hmm. through the, I mean, the, the frame and you know, doing the improv stuff of, of pretending to be a website. I mean, that was that was facilitating, even though it was like on a stage. Yes. Speaking yes. out to us. Oh, at least I felt it was facilitating because you did. Um, uh, open up your mind to further thought. Uh, I, I like they say that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Even on the stage, I would I would break I break the wall and like you know actually have uh, interactivity. Mm-hmm. I think that's again going back to those teaching roots. Um, I think I'm doubling down more on that lens on what I do these days. So even though it's been there all along, it's can I articulate more of that and do more of that because I think that's what energizes me. Mm-hmm. And I think here I know. Uh, the midpoint of my career, I'm thinking a lot more about what energizes me, what drains me, what do I want to do more of, mm-hmm. well, what do I want to do less of, and it really is those types of things. So, mm-hmm. like you're talking about the uh, role playing, the browser exercise, mm-hmm. or um, even the mental notes cards, and I have I have a lot more ideas like that. Uh, to me, those are in that case, those are tools to facilitate learning. Um, one of the things that was, I, I wouldn't say it was planned for, but it was a nice surprise with the mental notes card deck was. 
uh, all the different ways people would write to me and tell me they were using them. I'm like, that's awesome. I, I put this tool out there, but mm. then people are using it in these amazing different ways. Yeah. Um, so whether it's a tool or a canvas, like the polarity mapping stuff that uh, yeah, that we talked about um, in one of the link shows we had. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Whether it's that, whether it's uh, you know a workshop, whether it's um, like in the keynote tomorrow, I'm actually going to hand out uh, sort of. I hesitate to say infographic, infographic concept model, mm. but it's really to tee up um, questions we should be thinking about as designers. I don't have the answers, but what I've tried to do is frame or articulate the questions we mm. should be asking about. Nice. So I love it when you're saying that as you're actually learning more and having more to say, you're speaking less. Because trying you're to, yes. Yeah, you're allowing <laughs> the participants and the learners to actually be the ones well, talking more and actually reflecting on what they're doing. That is my interpretation of what you're saying. Absolutely. And that's hard, mm -hmm. like, yeah. especially if you're opinionated mm -hmm. and you have lots of ideas. Uh, you want to get them out there. But there's, you know, if it w you can speak for an hour and, and watch people take away a few tidbits, or you can double down on the essence of what you want to say and figure out how to create the conditions where people engage with that. Mm -hmm. and, and the effectiveness th of the latter approach is so much better. And so it's one of these things, okay, I'm going to try to say less or do less, but what people will get out of it will be even better. Um, there's, also, there's also along with that um, something I'm honestly wrestling with, um, the idea of empowering people to discover things on their own and discover their own ways of doing things mm -hmm. um, versus uh, particularly as designers. I think we often have this idea of this intent or this outcome mm -hmm. that we want for people. And I, I struggle with that. Like sometimes I have this you know, learning outcome where I want to lead people, yeah. but is that a very specified thing? Like, do I want them to think like I do, or do I want to guide them on a journey if they arrive somewhere else? That's okay. Like that's, right. that's something I struggle with. What could they teach me then as well? What could they teach yeah. me as well? Yes, absolutely. But isn't one, I mean, one of the challenges there perhaps is, is, is just how our whole way of working is framed, that we're, we're kind of built up to, um, to kind of Oh, now we're going to do a workshop, we're going to do a journey mapping workshop, or now we're going to do this. We, we, we've kind of got that, uh, but it's not, the, it's not deliverable thinking, but it's the ex expectation that us as UXers will know what tool to use and we'll, we'll, we'll run with that tool and it will deliver what we need to make good stuff. And it's not really that, that, that simple. Uh, oh, no, absolutely not. Um, or desirable. Well, I think, <laughs> yeah, I think with these tools, actually I have a couple of thoughts there with these tools. A lot of it's a about articulating a point of view, like so a, a customer journey map. Mm. We want to talk about here is the ideal customer journey, here's how things should go, like here's how it's broken today, here's how we'll make it better tomorrow. So you do a current state, future state. Um, I have a great tool. Um, I have a couple challenges uh, for that though. Um, one would be, um, one would be what we were just talking about, the whole idea of intent. Mm. So who's to say that's the best? experience all things considered i mean there's there's a definitely a bit of uh, paternalism there or like i've done the research i am the designer mm -hmm. i am the creator i know what's best um and, and in many cases i mean that may be accurate like if you design an experience you design a podcast you have best practices you have experiences so you want to see things better um, it comes from a good place right mm -hmm. but i'm i'm learning to challenge that particularly in learning areas or discovery areas where i might have something to learn myself as the designer. Um, so that intent part is the, the one thing we're wrestling with. The other is uh, I look at a lot of our artifacts and they're designed very much at the level of an individual person or user. And I think increasingly the, problem, increasingly the problems we have um, aren't that straightforward mm -hmm. or simple. They're more of a systems nature where you have multiple players and multiple users. And so I'm looking for more and more tools that show the interaction of all the actors and all the stakeholders um, and treat them more equally and don't just double down on one particular actor's journey mm. uh, or person's journey. Um, and that's, that's um, in, my, in the talk I'm giving right now on uh, the future of design, that's one of the things I say is, and this is kind of a catchphrase that I picked up from elsewhere, but it's from uh, uh, we're moving from human-centered design to humanity-centered design. Mm -hmm. And it's the idea of there's a lot more people involved. And I, I like that um, just as a catchphrase or to anchor against something that contrasts there. Yeah. Is, that, is that what led you to think as well about the polarity mapping? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, the Yeah, and I think I in the post I wrote on that, that was for UXmas, uh, 
I hinted that there's a, I want to start sharing a lot more tools like this that help us facilitate complex discussions. And the great thing there with polarity mapping was, um, I think so many of us, so different adjacent space, so many of us, particularly with a business mindset, are trained to think in a very rigorous analytical way where the goal is to make a decision. So then you get two tensions. I think the example I used in that article was uh, learning and research versus just execution, doing diving in, right, and learning that way. Mm. And uh, we see companies who double down on one or the other. And the point was it's a both and. Yeah, it's not an either or, it's a both and. And the polarity mapping uh, tool or, or as an exercise that you do in an afternoon, it helps teams with those different biases, different perspectives come out and say, oh, yeah, we can't double down on one perspective or the other. We have to, we have to be very zen-like and balance, <laughs> balance mm -hmm. them all at, at all the time. Um, and if we do double down on one perspective or the other, we're going to lose in some yeah. way. Yeah. Which is that the, the, which many of us do have those kind of noble causes, and you you kind of um, you know, bloody-mindedly go for your noble cause, but it's not it's not going to happen. It, it is a noble cause, no. but it's more balanced in reality. Yeah, and there is. It's. I, I was quick to point out there are things that are in fact problems that need rigor and analysis, and you have to commit, make a decision. Mm. It's when we treat things that aren't that mm. that are complex, and there does need to be this balance. When we treat them in this this one-dimensional way. That's when things get go go south very quickly, mm -hmm. and so the I, the challenge there was, all right, if this is something where it seems like it's a polarity and not a problem to be solved, then uh, then let's use a different tool that whose aim is not to pick one or the other. Its aim is to understand at all times the virtues of both and the the dang the dark sides of both. Yeah, which is facilitating. Which is facilitating. Yes, it is. Yes. And I, I love doing that exercise where, I mean, I found this tool, uh, the polarity map, so I, I didn't create it at all. Um, and then there was facilitation even in the labeling of the polarities for, for the whole room exercise. And I even learned along the way, like what I had labeled, the, the intent of those words didn't mean the same thing for everyone. So there were some groups who said, well, we changed the label of the polarity to this because that made more sense. I was like, that's great, right? That's, that's, and I opened the door for that. Um, for groups to do that, because I was like, I'm not entirely sure that these, I named these correctly. I know there's, the entities are right, I just mm -hmm. don't know if I articulated them or labeled them accurately. So that was actually one of my questions, if the tools, how, how rigid are they? Do they evolve over time? Because I'm thinking of the empathy map that Dave Gray drew many, many years ago that has evolved over time mm -hmm. and has made new releases of that. And, be, and been used in different contexts. Yeah, and actually involving the people in your workshop into evolving the tool, that's fantastic. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, I. I am um, frustration of mine is the dogma that we attach. Yes. Just going to ask you about that. That <laughs> we, we get that whole thing's like, what tool, you know, do we use, and and how do you how do you open up? How do you explain a tool? Kind of convey the value in the tool at the same time as you convey or you you open up, like you said, the door to let them tweak things and and play with it. Yeah, so that's so it's weird. I'm gonna I'm gonna make a statement, but in the con coming off of polarity mapping, I'm gonna say like that's a tool that's rigorous and been tested. And that's probably for what it is really good. Not that you couldn't do a forked version of it or something different, um, but I would say it things like the business model canvas, mm. they've been tweaked and they're pretty good as is. Although in the case even in the case of the business model canvas, there are variants and things that have come even the. Uh, the, the folks that created that have created a, you know, uh, related versions like the value proposition canvas. Um, so, I mean, I think in general, though, yeah, these are all tools. They're all, I, I like to use a, a word from architecture, they're all just scaffolding, you mm -hmm. know, so we put it up while we're making the building, but mm -hmm. the scaffolding gets taken down and thrown away afterwards. And so these, whether it's an artifact we create, like a customer journey, or whether it's a tool to facilitate a difficult conversation, like polarity mapping, it's all scaffolding to get people thinking in the same direction or yeah. aligned or communicating or understanding or sharing ideas, that's, that's their function. Um, so it, it frustrates me when I see people locking on to the details of this is how you do the tool and no, you can't change. I'm like, no, it's just, mm -hmm. it's just a structure that someone created somewhere and it worked in their situation and they shared it more broadly because they thought other people could benefit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that's the, the, in fact, the workshop one of the challenges of the visual display of information workshop that I'm doing 
is I think there are folks who walk in want to know, okay, how is this going to help me make better journey maps or better wireframes right. or better data visualizations or whatever? And it's not that, and I'm very clear about that. Um, and, but I, what I'm challenging people with is this is a little bit deeper than that. It's more of a, the universal visual language behind all of those. Mm -hmm. And if you understand this visual language, then you're not trapped by these tools or a slave to these tools. You can make these tools do whatever you need them to do. Mm -hmm. um, so customer journey is a great example. Customer journey service blueprints, very popular, right? Yeah. Um, but I work with folks who... Uh, we'll do something different where suddenly we'll just change up all the lanes and instead of the normal like front stage backstage lanes or the emotional journey and then the you know everything else we'll say well let's make all the lanes actors because we've got 13 actors in this case it's not about one and like and let's do something simple like that and the question comes well what kind of artifact is this is this uh you know, they, they <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. It's just, it had time on one axis and it had actors on the other. And then we had a third axis where we mm -hmm. looped in tools, you know, in, in this group. Like, I don't know. We just made it up, right? But we used a visual language to create something that was relevant to our situation and our problem. And that has to be the real question, the intent of the tool you're producing. It, it's not, it, did you fill it out correctly? It's, is it performing? Is it performing the task exactly. that you wanted to? Exactly. Is it having an impact? Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, the battling with our, our in it um, uh, desire to to label things and and put it into categories. So we 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 take we learn the tools. We go to you know uh, conferences or workshops or uh, education sessions, and we say, oh, "Well, now now I've learned how you do that mapping mm. tool or whatever, and I'm going to now put it into mm. that box in my head that says that tool, that purpose." One of the problems is, of course, that clients I see are learning that this is a delivery. Yeah. So the clients actually ask, we want a customer journey map. And if it doesn't look like they expect it to look, then that's a problem. Yeah, I've been in that. Yeah, historically, I've been in that situation. Mm -hmm. um, I think the more kind of codified is the right word, the more hardened that UX gets, the more you have that. Mm -hmm. I just feel like that's dangerous because that gets us into the... Um, and I think there's an article going around right now, the McDonaldification yes. of yes. UX. Is, like yeah. it's just we're it, we're our goal is to crank out these artifacts, mm. and that I think if you play that forward again, going back to like future design topics, if you play that forward, that ultimately devalues our industry because yeah. then you have a lot of people doing UX theater, going through the motions, but it wasn't really the right tool or the right thing for the job. And yeah, the long long tail of that is, or long effect of that is uh, yeah, what's all this UX stuff? Mm. We don't need it. Like we tried it. They created their customer journeys and mm. blueprints, and it didn't really help us. And in doing so, we lose sight of why those things were created in the first place, which was to solve a very specific problem that maybe th we didn't have the same problem in this yeah. case. Mm. And uh, on what basis they were created as well, because what's interesting about some of these tools, like the customer journey map, is that people start making them before they actually do any research. Oh, Because yeah. they're so pretty, <laughs> and, and, and <laughs> clients love them. <laughs> it's, it's, it's almost like it's accepted uh, within the industry sometimes to yeah, start doing it and you can test it afterwards and then you never have time to actually do the research. And it's like, yeah, this is kind of right because we talk to the client and this is how they so see yeah. their... You mean didn't do the research? Of course, you had a half a day workshop yeah. with the client yeah. where you got all the information mm -hmm. you need to produce it. I'll tell you an interesting <laughs> thing. I've, I've, uh, I don't know how it is in Europe, but we're seeing like these tools adopted beyond mm -hmm. designers. Mm -hmm. So design practices are being braced by product teams mm -hmm. and engineering groups and... Um, you have teams of engineers being asked to go out and do research, which I think is awesome. It's part of the democratization, democratization of design. But in doing so, what happens is I think you get more of that dogma, right? More of the this is how it has to be. Um, the context of those, some of those tools is lost. And you get um, a lot of what I've described as the adolescent fumbling where people are trying new mm -hmm. stuff and they're mm -hmm. doing it poorly. But bust their hearts like they're using these tools they're embracing this design mindset and these design tools and so i'm seeing the role of designer shift to be more of a coach and a supporter in these cases mm -hmm. and also correcting and saying yeah you don't need this tool in this case but the thing that i was going to ask is um I don't know if it's unique in the u.s or if we're seeing this all over but i'm seeing companies where they're starting to mandate like internally every team will do a customer journey map right mm -hmm. every yeah. team will do these things mm -hmm. um and you, you see exactly that, where someone will come to a designer, because you're a designer, you know about this, right? So, um, yeah, we need to cr create one. It should only take a few hours, right? <laughs> and, and no research, <laughs> it's just an artifact, right? And it's, you know, bless their hearts, well-intended, right? But someone's told them it has to be part of the process. Mm. And so uh, 
um, there's no context or understanding mm. of why it's useful or valuable. Mm. Um, well, that's um, we've, we we know through teaching. We, we, you know that you, you often learn things best when you you try and 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 fail. Or you, you don't really fail. You actually just learn why that first attempt wasn't going to succeed. And this is kind of what we're saying with some of these these tools. I mean, yeah, let them bless out. Let them get <laughs> on with using this. And and they kind of they need to see that it doesn't work like that. So you can then facilitate or enable. The, the the further learning of, of what is going to mm. work better in that situation. So that goes back to to uh, an opinion I'm forming that I think increasingly, um, I mean, there was still, before I make the statement, there's always going to be a need for the craft designers who know what they're doing are really skilled. But I'm seeing more broadly, particularly when you talk about UX and experience design topics, you need more uh, folks who are comfortable switching and being more coaches and consultants mm -hmm. and mentors, uh, coaching teams of multidisciplinary teams on how to do these things mm -hmm. and how to do it better, how to improve, um, and in the process learning as well, you know, uh, as I hadn't thought of doing it that way, that's, that's pretty cool, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how many of, of us are ready for that switch. Like, obviously, it's something I love doing, but um, it is a different different mindset to get your hands off the thing and say my the object the artifact mm -hmm. I'm working with now is people right and mm -hmm. cultures like that's that's my design mm -hmm. focus mm -hmm. I think I mean I've, I've been playing with this thought as well recently and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what to call it but I think it's like it's almost like the UX of UX <laughs> yeah yeah you know, in the way. way that we're kind of you know, moving on maturing and there is this uh, realization that we need to facilitate things more uh, mm -hmm. rather than just kind of do things and that kind of I mean, it's just we, we need to start thinking about how do we experience or how do we deliver UX in itself. So you end up being almost mm. looping on yourself the UX mm. of UX. Absolutely. I think, I think researchers are sort of the canary in the coal mine uh, mm. for this, where um, I'm seeing more groups where, again, everyone's asked to do research. Everyone understands the value of research, but uh, not everyone's a good researcher. And so those who are on staff and are trained, I think the increasingly important role is for them to work through others and mm -hmm. you know for 80 90 percent of the user research just coach or look over the interview questions mm -hmm. or shadow some folks who are doing research mm -hmm. and then actually do research directly maybe 10 percent of the time when it's a really tricky case or right. you need someone who's really skilled at, and trained at research but that's you know that's um you see people who are like i'm, I'm a researcher i just want to keep doing research that's what i'm good at and people are like no that that makes sense i'll 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 Instead of being the bottleneck, I'll train up 20 other people to do research. And um, in the near term, they won't do it as well as I can because that's not what they went to school mm -hmm. for or trained for. But, wow, suddenly we have a culture that's embracing research exactly. and not skipping it. Yeah. Yeah. So what we're saying is really you can increase the value of your design team mm -hmm. uh, immensely by just m making certain that there's a coach in place. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've, you know, in my role, it's a bit of an education role, but mm. I'm quick to say I'm not here necessarily for the design nerves as much as the design practice, as yeah. I see more and more people embracing design and practicing it. Mm. So in that coaching role, what, what, what is it that you have to think about as a coach uh, for designers? What are the most important aspects of it? Uh, I mean, ev everyone's a bit different. I would say the biggest lesson I am learning is... Uh, there's a big distinction between being a coach and being a consultant. So as a consultant, you're often hired to bring a point of view, a very strong point of view often. As a coach, it's almost the opposite where you're trained to ask mm. questions and help people figure things out. So even if in the first two minutes, I know exactly, I could diagnose and know exactly what's going on. It's not my job to tell them. Um, it's my job to let them figure that out. Mm. So it's all about asking the questions mm. that will guide them to that conclusion. Yeah. Um, or, you know, maybe I'm, I'm wrong in my diagnosis and I'll learn something along the way. Exactly, yeah. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's, it's very different. And that's, that's hard. Like I'll go mm. into one-on-ones with mm. folks that I'm coaching or mentoring, which is different as well. And, uh, it's, yeah, it's hard for me to bite my tongue and like, mm. not just say, God, oh, this is the problem. You mm. gotta go do this. And it's, it's amazing. Mm. I maybe 45 minutes in the conversation, people will say, you know, I just had a thought maybe what I need to try is mm. X and that mm. X is what popped in my head, you know, at the beginning of the mm. conversation. I'm like, yeah, I think that'd be a great idea. Yeah. They came to that conclusion. They own it. Um, or maybe it's not It's not exactly the X I thought of. It's mm. something different. I'm like, 
that's fabulous. I think that's great. But it's their idea. They own it. There's agency involved. Yeah, exactly. um, it's not someone else saying, you know, this is what you need to do. And, you know, th I think that ownership and that agency mm -hmm. is really critical. I think you, you, you say that, that thing between being a consultant and being a um, facilitator or a coach. Sorry. Um, but then what about the difference then between being the coach and the leader? Uh, so I... I actually have a, so I have a point of view on this. I actually think the role of leaders, particularly in the 21st century in information environments, um, is is more of that of a facilitator. Mm -hmm. um, I think we are in the same way a facilitator at workshop says, "Here's the goal." I think leaders should set the purpose or the vision, um, mm -hmm. non-specified but specific enough that everyone knows when it's achieved. Right, and that's. Um, that in and of itself is a challenge, right? Because you have these lofty vision statements, mission statements that are so fuzzy, they, they're not, they're nothing to grab onto. So you need to craft a good, like, here's why we exist, here's how we're going to change the world, here's how it will be different in five years, and here's how we'll know when we reach that. And that last part's really critical. We'll know we've reached this vision when this happens, right? Um, so I think your job is to do that, but then get out of the way and let the teams figure that out, encourage that autonomy. Mm -hmm. Um, I see so many cases where the people who know the most are, it's, it's kind of cliche, but it's the people on the front lines doing the work. And if they could just be empowered to to make the choices and direct things, the companies would be so much better. But, you know, we're, we come from this historical command and control. Mm -hmm. We have this altitude view that you don't. So mm -hmm. just, you know, there are details you can work out, but we're calling the shots. And I, I almost embrace a reversal of that or a flip. Um, and in terms of the altitude and we see things you don't see, well, that's the facilitating structure, right? That's the, we gonna, we're going to draw the borders, we're going to define perhaps who we think our competition is or the competitive experiences but and our vision, but you go figure it out. Like, we made the sandbox, now yeah. you go play in it and, and show us what can be done. So do you think you can, can you adopt um, um, a, a leadership style that is facilitating? Or do you need to... Do you need to build the culture or, or the, the organization first to allow that to happen? Ooh, that's an excellent question. Uh, I mean, I would say, I didn't know where your question was going, so I was going to say both and, right? <laughs> it's, but, but you're right. If you were to walk into a culture that wasn't used to that, I mean, they expected more of the, the top down. I, I don't know. As I'm digging more into this, I'm digging into a lot of uh, books and research around organizational cultures, um, I'm seeing it's almost a release or a relief when you have a change in leadership and the leaders do say, you know what, you know more than I do, or I'm going to, I'm going to draw the, the boundaries, right? Create mm. the sandbox, but you figure it out. Mm. Um, and so, I mean, the extreme of this are some of the, you know, flat, is it meritocracy type yeah. organizations, mm. right? And Zappos is brought up. There's others in Europe that are brought up doing this. Um, but I think in general, um, uh, there's still a lot that these organizations are learning. Every situation is different. But I think in general, it tends to be uh, an improvement over the way things were. And when there's a change in leadership again and someone tries to bring back the old way, that usually fails uh, miserably. Um, that oh, seems to be the conclusion. Yeah. So I think it's this. It's just the natural course of things. It's just we'd have a whole generation or two of business leaders who were not trained to think in this way. Um, yeah. It's almost like, like you would coach that change because part mm -hmm. of coaching is also asking the people, how can I help you? And if they need leadership of the former style, yes, they'll actually ask for that and you can move incrementally uh, towards more autonomy. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. We're, um, you know, there's, uh, uh, there's a lot of training being done that almost gets pushes people in a slow way or nudges people in a slow way to this. And it's very indirect, but it's focusing on this mindset. Mm -hmm. And so um, I can say at work, we're doing a lot of self-awareness training. Uh, and the whole ethos is to move uh, the company from being, or move any company from being an ego-driven company where you get competition and hierarchy and all that to being more of an eco-driven company. That's the ethos of this particular program that we're doing. But you see it show up also with folks like Brene Brown and her focus on vulnerability and courage and values. You see it show up with uh, the work of Amy Edmondson talking about psychological safety and building safety in the workplace. And I think a lot of her work uh, got in the limelight in 2015 when Google did their study on what was what made effective teams. Right. Um, a lot of the stuff about radical candor. I mean, you're seeing these these ideas 
uh, come into the forefront in business circles. I think they're all part of this ethos of how do we empower people? How do we create a safe space? How do we create a culture where people can be authentic and be themselves? And I think part of that's kind of a revolt against the traditional, we're going to treat people as, mm. you know, I hate to say it, but cogs in a machine, right? Yeah. And we don't do that literally yeah. anymore, but yeah. in many ways we still have these hierarchies mm. and decisions are made at the top and ripple down. Mm. Exactly. Um, Once you zoomed out, then mm. it does become head counts and kind of yep. productivity and, you know, all these kind of... You have individual no, people yeah. who bring really, really great things to the organization, but that's not what we need from this role, right? Mm. And so it's like, how do we flip that inside out and say... Um, you know, here are the amazing, here's the amazing talent we have, here are the people on the bus, mm. to use that phrase, like, where do we want to go, what can we do with the people we have? And, yeah. Which for me also brings it actually to the domino effect of like how I am treated is how I will treat others. So actually the people I am designing for, I will treat them better by being better treated myself by my organization. Yes. So positive outlook. I love that. <laughs> yeah, that that's really hard. Like mm. um, in these trainings where we're talking about being mm. vulnerable, it often requires... Mm. Uh, one person to like shed their armor first and the question is well, what if I drop my armor I expose myself and the other person doesn't they just mm. they just yeah. spear me yeah. right and that's a that's a valid and common fear and I mean there's no easy answer but what I usually challenge people with is okay you can both keep your armor on and keep going the way you have or you can take your armor off take a risk and yeah, either it goes poorly or the other person takes their armor off too and now you're in a much better place. Yeah. Is the risk worth it to you? And then you need to make sure you've built up um, sufficient trust before you take the armor off. Uh, trust, although sometimes taking the armor off is the act of building trust. Mm -hmm. um, again, every situation is a little yeah. bit different, but, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I think that's the idea is can you, can you be your whole self? Can you be vulnerable? Mm -hmm. And where will that lead? And the, the faith and the hope is mm -hmm. it'll start over time to create these more authentic, um, wholesome uh, organizations. Yeah. Positive and lots of food for thought and looking forward to hearing more from you in the future. Thanks for sitting down with us, Stephen. Uh, thank you, I, it was a pleasure. Oh, wow, um, teaching, workshops, tools, coaching, facilitating, leadership. We went on a bit of a journey there, didn't we? Mm. But, but I think the theme running through it, though, was, was Stephen's passion for facilitating and that that whole thing about trust openness um humility not being precious mm. about our work and artifacts and and not being trapped by dogma yeah the you know, designers as design coaches yeah and i do love how a lot of the people we are talking to nowadays are talking about coaching as a way forward for designers and design leaders to actually help and not have exactly that, not have these dogmas around what tools to use, how we do our work, but actually help people discover their own path. And the interesting thing about this is that I, I keep thinking that we need to take it one step further. Because as a designer, and since we touched upon a, a bit, we could have talked about it more, the paternalism of design, the, the, the thinking that we do this research and so we know what's best for the user and so that's what we're going to build. We need to move further away from that and help designers become better at being humble in the way that coaches are humble, meaning, uh, the way I'm thinking about it, that we actually need to help our users explore their own paths uh, as they're making decisions on our websites or in our services. We haven't decided for them what the best outcome is for them. We need to be as open as Stephen is in his workshop when he's facilitating, he's not teaching his practices so that other people will adopt his practices. He's teaching uh, people that they can be in charge of their own path. And so you can interpret mm. things in so many different ways and allowing people to interpret things and moving in their own direction, even as you are designing for the people, the users, as we tend to call them, and realizing that they too also need to be able to make their own decisions. This is difficult. I mean, in, in a business sense, uh, it, it's, it sounds really scary. That Why would we not make sure that people follow this path which leads, which leads to profit for the company? But this, I think, is the sustainable future way of thinking around this. We need to, um, mm. everybody's adopting this new way of facilitating and coaching. We need to bring that further into not just the way we work, but what we actually produce. Oh, I think, um, I think I'd have related another 
a similar kind of experience of looking back on this and and but I, f- I framed it a little bit differently in my head but but at the same time similar that um both me you and steven um were were uxs or designers that have been in the business for over 20 years and and the whole thing of designers as coaches or the the maturity into coaching roles is is very much tied to um, our experience and our generation perhaps um and whereas you've picked up on um that that um that communication um, or that that um interface towards um the user as as a designer um i was thinking about the uh, the way you would look at this from being a new designer into the industry right. um because Yes, it's one thing coaching um, or mentoring or coaching mm. people in the industry to to be um, uh, finding their own journey mm. and so on, rather than being stuck in dogma mm. and using tools and deliverables. But if you come into this business of ours and you've, you are um, I mean, we're very much hung up on those artifacts, mm. especially in the very early stages of your, of your yeah. careers. Um, so I can see that as a as a real challenge. I mean, how how do you how do you kind of dive straight into design facilitation as as someone who's junior in the industry, um, when the expe- expectation upon you perhaps from the organisation? We touched on culture mm. in the interview. Um, if you if you're faced with a culture of processes and artifacts, um, and you're still learning or becoming to understand the importance of facilitation and um and and finding a path for the user mm. and finding a path for yourself um in all this that's a challenge it is a challenge i, I mean and i i totally agree with the, with the challenge and how i mean i know that when i'm teaching everybody asks me about so what tools do you use so what models do you use how do you go forward with that isn't the solution somehow that when you come out and start working that you need to work alongside someone who is aware of the coach coaching thinking the coaching practices so that it's mm. you learn from each other it's not it's not you can't just go out there and and, and learn it start doing it no. but it, but it's I, a muscle you need to practice yeah mm. i'm actually laughing a little bit now because I'm, I'm realizing mm. we're, we're almost kind of doing what we're we're kind of living what we thought mm. about we're we're looking for the we're looking for the recipe we're looking exactly, for the answer yes. we're looking for the we're looking for the uh, process part mm. to say this is what everyone mm. should do whereas um you know what what Stephen mm. talked about and what we mentioned was that yeah there are going to be organizations where you need to be the facilitating mm. um leader um depending on who's on your mm. bus um, what resources you've got? What can we do with these wonderful people? Um, and the same thing when you apply for jobs, when you kind of start out in firms that or organisations, find one that matches you or gives you that right feeling. Yeah. Um, and that's maybe exactly you know if you feel like you do want to kind of work on deliverables for a while, then find somewhere that will allow you to do that while still growing. I think um, I think so. You're you're onto something there. That I mean, you need to feel accomplished using the tools before you can let them go. Uh, mm. It's just that a lot of people don't let them go, and you need to be aware that at some point y- these tools need to be something that is flexible. That you use out of uh, different tools at different, and you you model the tools differently based on the circumstances and the context. Uh, yeah. The last course that I do, uh, where I teach with ethics, the last course actually in two year program. W- what I tend to tell them is, uh, and start off with is, what if you just learned during two years is completely wrong. <laughs> which which sort of <laughs> I mean that's daunting for the students of course but it, it's a fun way to start talking about it how could we solve problems in different ways because by then they're also mature enough to realize they've started seeing patterns in the way they work they know what works and what doesn't work and how they mm. can feel brave enough to try out new things uh, and also I think uh, what sounds interesting and, and, and I can imagine being a valuable lesson from that is it trains your skills of um, empathy and understanding and uh, facilitation and mm. um, moving from from place A to place yeah. B. Because if you're a group, you're suddenly told what you've learned is wrong. <laughs> you then have to discuss what that was and then discuss what right could be and transition mm. everyone in your group from a space where what they knew was right and is now wrong to a new place exactly. where they they together accept the new way of doing things. 
I love this. We should ah, we should explore this more. Uh, this is really interesting. Ah, yes, I agree <laughs> with you. Thank you. But time's yeah, up. Time, time's <laughs> running out. Thanks for spending your time with us. Uh, links and notes from this episode found on uxpodcast.com as per usual. And if you can't find them in your pod playing, pod, pod, that's, that's a tongue twister. Your pod playing it tool is. of choice. <laughs> <laughs> and um, recommended listening after this one. Um, episode 201, Consistency, which features um, two excellent articles, one by Jared Spool about consistency and the other of course um, by Stephen um, which we referenced a couple of points a couple of times during this um, interview yeah. um, polarity mapping and remember you can contribute to funding the show by visiting uxpodcast.com slash support remember to keep moving see you on the other side mm-hmm.